welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today to our lunch lecture, uh, organized by CM Generale. Okay, so uh, what I want to tell you guys before we start is um, that this lecture is actually part of a, a broader, a bigger, uh, yeah, a series of lectures, workshops, but also an exhibition that's taking place in the library right now, which was opened yesterday. So if you guys haven't seen it yet, after the lecture today, I invite you to go to the opposite corner of the library where we have a very informative and interactive exhibition on nuclear energy and the different viewpoints that have existed about it, at least in the Netherlands since the 1950s. So uh, as a program maker for SG, I was asked to contribute to this, uh, this endeavor and I thought, well, what do I know about nuclear energy? Well, not that much, but especially something that was very obscure to me was this fact, this issue of nuclear fuel. Where does it come from? We are, of course, in the midst of a energy transition worldwide. This point has become even more relevant, of course, the last few weeks with the war in Ukraine uh, and the issues with gas and oil, but of course, also the nuclear, nuclear reactor in, nuclear, uh, in Ukraine that was attacked. So, uh, yeah, a relevant issue. We're not going to get into the politics of it, though. We're not going to get into the science of nuclear fuel. What we're more going to look at is... Uh, the environmental and social impact of drawing these resources out of the soil. And of course, it's not our soil here in the Netherlands, it's somewhere else. So today we've invited uh, a radiation expert from Greenpeace, Dr. Jan Teule, who has actually visited areas in West Africa where uranium is mined. That's the area that we're gonna focus on. We're not gonna look at different parts of the world. This is really uh, her expertise because she visited it personally. But Jan is going to tell us more about that in a minute. Uh, again, we're going to have about 30, 40 minutes time for this presentation. There's going to be a little video in it as well. We had a second speaker today, Dirk Bonnick. Unfortunately, he is sick. It's a shame, but it happens in these times. You probably, everybody here knows somebody who's in isolation and quarantine uh, right now. But uh, graciously, graciously uh, Rihanna has agreed to take over some of the slides. So we're still going to get a bit of introduction into the interest, industry behind uranium mining as well. So after the presentation, we'll have time for a Q&A. Um, but for now, I'd like to give uh, a warm welcome to Dr. Jan Teule. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the welcome. Um, first of all, of course, thank you for inviting me. Um, and it's a pity that Dirk is not here, but I'll try to cover some of the things that he would probably have uh, have covered. But before I start, um, we, we arranged to have this lecture a month ago. Um, and at that time, it, it sounded like a good idea to choose this as a subject. But now I have to say with, with the war going on, um, there's, there's other issues around nuclear, the nuclear uh, chain that are much more worrying and that uh, myself and my colleagues are working on daily, which is the risks, of course, with uh, nuclear facilities in Ukraine being um, attacked or accidentally or on purpose. Um, there's four nuclear power stations in Ukraine with 15 reactors. There's the Chernobyl area, of course, still very polluted uh, and several research facilities as well. Um, so, yeah, if, if people want to think about uh, how cool is nuclear power? Then think about what can happen uh, in a war, which is pretty scary. So I wanted to say that before I start with the uranium mining story, um, maybe also before I start, uh, the presentation will first, after the introduction uh, about the nuclear industry, the uranium industry, it will focus on Niger. Um, that work was done in 2009, 2010. Um, you might say like, oh, that, that, that's pretty much outdated, but not much has changed. So the story uh, still applies. Um, I've around that time also visited other uranium mines. Uh, for example, in Brazil, we also did some scientific work, very similar impact, very sim similar story. Um, so that's why I think that this story can, can give you a good image of, of uh, what the uranium mine uh, can do. So the, the story will cover basically three rough sto uh, elements, the, the fuel market, uh, the Niger case study, and then uh, more looking specifically at the environmental and social aspects 
of it. So uh, yeah, the slides from uh, Dirk. Um, where does it come from? And uh, yeah, he's from Laka. The very, if you want to know anything about nuclear, um, the whole nuclear industry, any information, go to Laka. They they have a huge database of information. Um, first, for those who are not familiar with the the nuclear fuel chain, um, this is basically the chain that we're talking about. So here you have the uranium mining, um, the nuclear reactor where it's being used to produce uh, energy, electricity specifically. Um, and then before you get the, the, how do you say that, the uranium into the reactor, you need to enrich it and make fuel out of it. So there's a few steps in between. And then after it's in the reactor, you get spent fuel which uh, in some cases is being reprocessed, in some cases goes directly to uh, the waste. Of course, there's waste flows from each of these steps. And then um, from the enrichment, you can also produce highly enriched uranium, which can be used in nuclear weapons. Um, and then the same applies for spent fuel. If you do reprocessing, a um, whole different story, we go, will not go into it today. Uh, but you separate out the plutonium out of the spent fuel, and that can then also be used to to make nuclear weapons. So that's in a overview of the chain. But we will focus on the uranium mining side in this presentation. Um, this is uh, where Dirk wanted to show how much of the the fuel is actually uh, that is used in in the European Union. Where does it come from? <coughs> and Comparing natural gas, uh, coal, and oil, and uranium, you see um, a lot of it is coming outside outside of the EU. In case of uranium, everything is coming outside of the EU, um, and about 20% from Russia. So that's just some st statistics for you. Um, the uranium production in the year 2020, so two years ago. Um, I'm not going to talk about the numbers, but of course the size of the blocks are representative of uh, how much they contribute to the market. You see that Kazakhstan is the biggest, and then there are still big producers in Canada, Namibia, Niger, Uzbekistan, Australia, a little bit smaller in uh, Russia, China, Ukraine, uh, and then some small, 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 small um, in Brazil, for example, as well. If you compare that with uh, the cumulative production until now, so you see where historically also uranium came from, and then you see USA had a very big contribution, uh, Europe as well, Germany, Czech Republic, France, Hungary, Bulgaria. So all those countries have contributed quite a lot, but those mines have all uh, been closed. And South Africa was also very, a big contributor. Uh, but those mines have also uh, run out, basically. So then uh, you're left with Canada, um, Kazakhstan, Niger is just still active uh, as well. There are some other countries in Africa, since we are focusing also on social and environmental impacts, um, that are also producing or have produced uranium as well. Um, this is uh, the, the resources still available. Um, in the different countries. You see Australia Australia has a huge uh, uranium resource. Kazakhstan is still big. Canada is still big. Uh, Niger, South Africa, Namibia are also still big. So, um, yeah, you can also see that in Africa and in Brazil, for example, there's several poor countries that have a lot of uranium ore and are therefore interest, uh, of interest to the countries who use nuclear energy. So that's just uh, something I wanted to point, point out in, in this slide. And what are we talking about in terms of uh, how much of the material? Uh, and th these are the numbers of a, of a thousand megawatt nuclear power plant. How much fuel do they need? Uh, how much enriched, enriched uranium hexafluoride is needed to produce that fuel? How much natural? So not enriched uranium hexafluoride is needed and how much uranium ore is needed to produce that fuel. And then you see that um, the ratio between the fuel and 
the material that you're going to get out of the earth is enormous. Uh, and producing uh, about 24,000 times as much volume um, of waste, waste rock, and that is radioactive, uh, low, low radioactive waste rock. Um, and then the enrichment, so the, the way you get the uranium out of the mine is, is a natural uranium, and that has about 0.7% of uranium-235, the isotope uranium-235. Um, for use in a nuclear power station, it needs to be enriched to about 4 to 5%. So that's what we call enrichment. Um, and that is done, for example, in Urenco in, in, uh, in Twente. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a, a, few, a few facilities around the earth that, that can do that. Um, but you see that a lot of that production is in Russia. Uh, a lot of that enrichment is in Russia. Um, and then uh, combined in Urenco uh, is the second player of that. But it's, so it's a it's a small market basically. So here I would like to show the video. You can show me how. <laughs> Here, in the desert of northern Niger, lies a forgotten battlefield of the nuclear industry. Dust, water, soil, and even scrap metal scattered around the area all carry an unseen but deadly threat. Landlocked in the Saharan desert, Niger ranks as the fourth poorest country on the planet. Its soil, however, is rich in mineral resources such as uranium. It's this precious metal providing the fuel for nuclear reactors, which drew the French nuclear industry to the region in the 1970s. Lured by the economic promise of the mining operation, settlers from Niger soon followed. Now, the twin mining towns of Akokan and Ali sit among a legacy of industrial waste, environmental destruction and radiation. Al-Mustafa al Hassan heads a local organization which has been protesting the effects of the uranium mining by French company Areva. While sounding the alarm bell at an international level, his priority is to inform the local people of the hidden danger. The people, no, I would say, they don't have fear because they don't know what is the radioactivity, they don't know what is the radioactivity. The priority of the people is the poverty. But, quand même, this problem, il faut pas les perdre de vue. Il est là. Les deux vont à la fois parce que la radioactivité augmente la pauvreté, parce qu'elle fait des victimes. Clouds of dust caused by a controlled explosion in the open pit mine carry poisonous gas towards town. Mountains of industrial radioactive waste sit in the open air for decades. And the shifting of millions of tons of rock and earth has corrupted a once clean source of groundwater that is also rapidly disappearing due to industrial overuse. Comme vous l'avez constaté, la faune est, a disparu, la flore a disparu autour de la ville d'Arlit. C'est vrai que c'est un pays désertique, mais quand même, il y a des arbres des, qui vivent dans des déserts. Donc l'héritage pour nous, c'est la pollution durable. A full, independent investigation of radiation levels and the impacts on human health and the environment has never been carried out. But in November 2009, Greenpeace and its partners were able to conduct a brief scientific investigation of the area. They measured radiation levels in and around the mining towns. In some cases, readings went over a hundred times above internationally recommended levels. Just within a few days, we found that the people of these villages are exposed to unacceptably high levels of radiation caused by radioactive materials in the street, radioactive scrap metal in the market, and it clearly shows that the mining companies owned by Arriva are not taking care of the problems. Soil and water samples taken by Greenpeace were investigated by the French Nuclear Research Institute, CRIRAD, in Valence. Its findings further confirm the radioactive contamination of the region. The analyses we have been able to show, first, the persistence of the contamination in uranium. Sur quatre des cinq échantillons d'eau, la quantité d'uranium dépasse les recommandations de l'Organisation mondiale de la santé. Ensuite, la présence d'autres substances radioactives, dont le radon, qui est un gaz radioactif et qui est dissous dans l'eau. Et puis la pollution par des éléments chimiques, 
par exemple des nitrates, de l'ammonium, du molybdène, à des concentrations pour les nitrates et le molybdène qui dépassent là aussi les recommandations de l'OMS. Pourtant, ces eaux sont toujours distribuées aujourd'hui à la population et aux travailleurs pour leur consommation. Exposure to radioactivity can lead to serious health issues such as birth defects, leukemia and cancer. Arriva claims conditions in the mines and their surroundings are safe and radiation levels are being monitored. Two local hospitals, funded by the company, check the health of workers and the rest of the population. The principal pathologies we have here are the two. Et les, les toux, les diarrhées, les dermatoses. Et donc euh, ces pathologies sont pratiquement les mêmes qu'on retrouve dans les autres régions du, du pays. Ce n'est pas du tout lié aux radiations. Arriva, however, fails to mention that the hospitals lack the equipment and expertise to properly diagnose cancer. Many ex-workers are already suffering from unexplained diseases. Almost 10 years ago, laundry worker Jigozaki collapsed during his work at the Somaier mine. Since then, he's been forced to retire and was never informed about the cause of his condition. Renewed interest in nuclear power as an alternative energy source to fight climate change has led to what some have termed a nuclear renaissance. Areva's operations have already spread to over 100 countries around the world. Here in Niger, the company is planning to open a new mine at this site called Imuraren. Its critics point out that 40 years of uranium mining have only resulted in massive damage to the environment instead of delivering on the economic promises to Niger. Je ne sais pas quoi dire aux gens de, de Imran. Si vous voulez, le, le, le fait qu'on demande l'exploitation de l'uranium, c'est pour lutter contre les fléaux de la pauvreté. Mais ce que nous constatons malheureusement après 40 ans, à Arlit en tout cas, ces fléaux n'ont fait qu'augmenter. Donc à Imran, je pense que c'est exactement la même chose qui va se passer. Et maintenant, si j'ai un appel, c'est d'appeler la population à être un peu plus vigilante pour qu'il y ait moins de pollution et qu'il y ait plus de retombées. On the same night that leaves most of Akokan's streets unlit, the uranium mined here is powering a million households a continent away. In about 10 years' time, the local economy will dry up as the mines run out of uranium. The 80,000 people living here and centuries of environmental pollution will all be left behind in the dust. So the, the good thing of doing this 10 years later is that it is 10 years later. The mine has been closed, one of them. Um, and yeah, now the, the people who work there don't have work. Uh, and they, they still need to, to figure out what to do with the rest uh, of their lives. So, um, yeah, the, the, of course, the pollution that you, sh you saw is not going to disappear when the mine closes. So and that's uh, what I will tell a little bit more about. Um, yeah, it was mentioned already in the video, so that it was based on France's need of uh, uranium, not only for... Uh, nuclear power stations, but also nuclear weapons. Um, and they started, it's one of their colonies, uh, Niger, so they started mining there. Uh, and they had a monopoly on the mining until 2007. Um, and then other companies like Canada, uh, Australia, China came in. Um, the mines are uh, here in the, in the desert. And here is basically where most of the people live. Uh, here is just... Uh, nomad uh, population um, and that's where the, the mines are, are being built or were being built and and this gives you an idea of um, this is basically that area in the desert uh, how how the concessions are being uh, divided so the land is basically cut up in pieces uh, and sold to the different mining companies who can then uh, decide to mine whenever they 
want to. And if you look in more detail, the blue ones are the, the French company Arriva. Um, and on the top, you see the, the Ali and Akokan uh, mines. And then the big one below is the Imouraren, Imouraren mine. Uh, and currently also the Chinese uh, mine is very active as well, which is this red uh, part. But it's, it gives you an idea of, okay, so, so the, the land is basically divided amongst the, sorry? And you can see here the, this is a whole country and this is a part of it. So, but yeah, if you want to know how big is the country, oof, you can Google it. <laughs> It's big, I can tell you. So uh, pictures of the mines, and uh, this is an open pit mine. Uh, this is the one in Ali, but the, the two villages are very close together. Um, and it was owned mostly by Arriva and Sopamin is the, the local mining company. So the Niger owned, but you see that 63% was owned by Arriva. Um, and you see also the, the vastness of the area that's being uh, opened up. And this is from uh, satellite images. And this is the underground mine is, uh, of the neighboring town. Uh, also, it's a bit more divided up, the ownership of that. Um, and everything happening underground. But so, of course, you don't have, you have less of the dust spreading of the open pit mines. Uh, but the, the radon gas, for example, is, is certainly spreading there as well. Um, these, these are the milling. Um, installations and uh, just yeah there's the, you get the ore of course you need to remove the 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 ore from the waste rock uh, and then you need to to grind it and and make it suitable for transport so that's the uh, milling is a, is a part in that process and then uh, in that process you you produce waste and the waste we call tailings um and uh, those are uh, partly stored under those flat uh, areas, uranium tailings, and partly in this big uh, waste storage, open open waste storage. And you see the color of all the chem chemicals that are used to, to do this processing. Uh, this uranium mining uses a lot of water, um, 270 billion liters in 40 years. And they used uh, more than 20%, and this was uh, 10 years ago, so they used to more than 20% uh, of the, the aquifer of water. Uh, and of course, that is not returning, and certainly not in the desert. So that is an, an impact for, for the future generations as well. And you already see the, the drought. Of course, it's, it's normal that deserts are dry. <laughs> but the, the locals, they say that it's, it's, uh, they can see the impact over the years that it has become more dry. Um, then the pollution, um, it, it, the, the mines, they affect the drinking water, they affect the air, they affect the soil, soil and they affect, uh, and they spread the radioactivity through uh, scrap metal. This research, I would need to mention as well, the partners that we did it with, so it's the local NGO called Agriama, and you saw it in the video already, the French lab laboratory, uh, Krirat, and, uh, and, and uh, Nigerian, uh, NGO Sherpa, Medicine du Monde and Rotap. I think I need to first here mention the water. Um, the, the drinking water is uh, affected, so it's not only the removal of water from the, from the aquifer, but it's also the, uh, because you penetrate the aquifer, uh, the pollution, the pollutants can also enter the, the drinking water. Uh, and that's not only radioactive pollutants, but also chemicals that, that are above the, the standards for safe drinking water. And of course, the people don't have another choice than to use it because uh, there is no other water. Uh, and this is also the pollution is not going to go away after the mine closes. Uh, so it's an, a, a lasting, uh, lasting impact. The radioactive dust from the open pit mine, so they do these big explosions to, to open up the, the mine uh, and that creates dust and, and the release of radon gas, which is spreading in the direct environments. And it's really not far. The photo is taken from the village. So it's really not far from the village. Then the waste rock is, uh, of course, it's, yeah, it's just basically dumped outside of the mine. And people use waste rock to build their streets and to build their houses, which means that houses and streets can be radioactive as well. 
uh, and also discharging more radon. So it's also un unhealthy to have to have that uh, to build your houses. Um, so when we were doing that research, then we were just walking on the street and you have certain areas uh, also in front of a hospital, for example, there was uh, very high uh, levels of radiation that was later removed by, by the company Arriva. Uh, scrap metal, I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of materials coming from the mine, like the, the trucks are coming out, the, the big uh, digging machines that they use, and then they are being sold on the market uh, without cleaning before. So all the, all the radioactive waste rock and materials are still uh, stuck on the machines. Uh, and that, that can give pretty high concentrations if they, those machines have been used for a long time. You saw the worker already in the, uh, in the video. Uh, so these are just some quotes. Just imagine that those people, they, they had a life before the mine was opened. They came to the mine, to, to that place to start working there. They were treated uh, like they say themselves, like animals. They, they don't get the protection that we get here in, the, in uh, Europe. They don't get the right information. They don't, they don't know, they don't understand the risks that they are being exposed to. Um, that, that is hopefully has, has improved over time because it was one of the points that was also very much raised by, by the, the NGO uh, Al Mustafa, who is also representing the workers. Um, so hopefully that has uh, improved a bit so that at least they, they would have more protection. But then there's also the issue of the, the local population not benefiting. So you can, you, you can work there and you can earn money, but you don't really, the country doesn't really benefit from the incomes from the mine. That goes to the, to the companies and to France. Um, yeah, that's basically what this is about. So the, the, the energy, the material is being used in another country uh, and is producing electricity. In, in Niger, most of people don't have ac access to electricity at all. Um, so it's, it's not like they have a direct benefit for, okay, we, we're digging up this dirty stuff, uh, but at least we get electricity. It doesn't work like that. So then, yeah, basically summarizing the impact um, in the social, social and, and uh, environmental impact of the uranium mining. It's a, it's a long, long term legacy. Also after the mine closure and after the mine closure, also there's no um, lasting benefits. Like it's not like the company has invested a lot to, to provide uh, continuous income also after the mine closes. So it's, it's, it's a temporary use. These people are being used, the country is being used to extract what is useful for, for the, in this case, France, but it's happening, of, of course, in many other countries. Um, and then when, when it's finished, they just leave. They, they set up some kind of, uh, say that, uh, after mining plan or something. But of course, it's, it's all temporary and not really solving the, the poverty of, of, the, of the country. Um, the radiological protection and monitoring is limited. The, the companies are doing something, but not like a comprehensive assessment, not with the resources needed to, to really go into uh, detailed uh, ensuring that safety is being, being followed. For example, the fact that we could find all that scrap metal on the market shows that there's no control when the material is leaving the mine. Um, and also after we raised it, because five or six years ago, uh, the CRIRAT, the NGO, the French NGO, went there again, did again measurements, but they still find this material leaving the market, so uh, leaving the mine. So it's, it's not improving as well. It, it shows that, that people, the, the, the company doesn't really care, I guess. And then um, you would say maybe there's a, a, a local nuclear monitoring center or a, a nuclear regulator, there is indeed a centre de radio protection, uh, but they don't have enough staff, they don't have enough money, uh, they don't have enough equipment, so they are not able to do the monitoring that is needed for this. They, they, they just go there once in a while, but they mostly just use the data of the company itself. And that is the, yeah, as you know, not always 
a reliable source. Uh, the health impacts of workers and locals, they haven't really been uh, assessed. So I cannot say there's health impacts because they have not been assessed. People who live there, they think there are health impacts. But it's hard to say because a lot of those diseases that you could get from exposure to uranium dust uh, can also be caused by, by the desert itself. It's not a healthy environment to live in any case. So it's, it's very difficult to do an assessment of the health uh, impact, but it could be done if you do a proper assessment before you open the mine and then again during, during your operations and after. Uh, and that is actually what we then call for because um, in, in these countries where, where uranium mining is still starting or ongoing, then you, you can actually improve the whole process as well. We are not in favor of, of using uranium mine, but um, we know that mining exists and we know it's happening. So when you do it in countries like this, at least do it in a way that it's um, not negatively impacting the, the population. Uh, so that means that you have to monitor, you have to do a comp comprehensive assessments of the situation beforehand, you do it during and after. You provide the, the support to the local population as needed, you, you give them uh, the knowledge that they need, you, you make sure that uh, the, there's a, a regulator who can control. <coughs> and Sorry, my, my voice. <coughs> and then <coughs> you make sure that also, <laughs> I think I should stop talking. <coughs> you make sure that they also, uh, the, the country also is able to benefit from the industry. Um, and I think, and it's especially a, a challenge in, in poor countries uh, like like in Africa, uh, where also the democracy is not so uh, not so strong, and uh, there's a lot of corruption. There's of course a challenge to make sure that the benefits uh, end up with the population. So it's it really asks a lot of the companies who invest that they they see that as a good um, important priority. Um, and that they work also to strengthen the, the local, uh, uh, I say that, the governance, that they also strengthen the governance in, in order to make sure that, that whatever is being uh, taken from the country is also given back to the country. Um, I think with that, I want to close. Um, maybe to say that, that we know mining, mining in general is dirty. Your main uranium mining is maybe extra dirty, but I, I cannot really put it on a scale, but um, it's something that we don't need. It's something that um, we can easily prevent of using. Also, if we, if we want to address climate change, we still don't use uh, need to use uranium. You saw the numbers in terms of the volumes of uranium ore that are needed to provide the nuclear fuel. Um, we, we don't need to do this to the local populations. We don't need to, to destroy their environment. Um, but if we do, at least let's, let's try to do it in a way that, that um, is fair to the local population. I think with that, I will stop. Thank you, Rihanna. Maybe you should take another sip of water and then I'll let somebody else talk for at least a few seconds because we now we do have some time for questions. Is there anybody who has a question for Rihanna? <coughs> yeah, are you comfortable with me walking up to you with the microphone? <laughs> I, I, I will stand as far as possible. <coughs> I'll hold the microphone. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. Well, thank you for the nice, uh, interesting talk. I was hoping to see more technical stuff, but this, well, this shows that the continent Africa is used to be colonially governed, but now the situation has not changed compared to the past. So everybody can exploit Africa and get stuff there. They bribe the government, so they say they get a, a lot aligned, but it's simply they give uh, money to corrupt government, and then uh, the, the elite of the country profits from it, and they, uh, well, they don't care for their, for their population. And of course, what should we do then? Should we have a UN regulation that uh, that we would forbid these practices? I'm not sure it's going to happen because uh, most countries that profit from it 
won't support that. So this so is a political problem, and it's our problem. It is a political problem, I agree with that. Um, I think, if you ask my opinion, um, I think it's because it's the rich com countries that go there and, and take it. So they have the responsibility to to decide on that. And I think as it doesn't necessarily need to be at the UN level to address it. It can be also at the country level. A country itself can decide, um, I'm not going to use that uranium, or if I'm going to use it, I'm going to do it in a better, more responsible way. If, uh, for instance, China does it in a cheap way, then they buy all the ore. And if you say you want to do it in a responsible way, then you're not welcome anymore. But you need to talk also with the local uh, local uh, government, because if they understand that the way that, that uh, China is doing it is not, in the long term, not helping them, because they are, they are not building their economy. That is it right, is. But they are corrupt. They don't care. I know. They are corrupt, but so they can say start start talking with corrupt people. But that's so why I also work. need to work with civil society to to make the them UN or some some other body that could enforce things. That would be a nice uh, way, but I, yeah, you would need strong countries that are bringing that that initiate UN processes to make a decision like that, and that is not easy to yeah, achieve. Yeah, yeah. So, I th from my perspective, I think the change should be at the country level. It should be uh, empowerment of, of the government, empowerment of civil society, making them aware of the situation. See some more hands. Yes, uh, I should I stand up? No, you okay. Um, I do agree with that because comparing the situation, it kind of reminds me of what's happening with the lithium in Bolivia. So what they actually did, they did make an agreement with the government. The president was voted because of the entire issue. And then corruption happened anyway. So it went all pretty okay. It was a German company. It was all good and right. But now we're driving Teslas on lithium and the entire country is being destroyed. So despite all the regulations, it's such a deep-rooted issue. So it's really difficult to think, like, how can you fix stuff like that? Because it's still, despite it happening in a correct way, it still turns out really, really wrong. Yeah, but yeah. It's <laughs> it's a bit depressing, but um, yeah. no, I know, but I th I still think that's the way to go, uh, even though it can still go wrong. Uh, the the people need to be empowered. The people in the countries need to be empowered to to be able to make decisions, to be able to assess the impact uh, and the possible benefits that they might have, and only then, of course, in a in a in a better political system, because a lot depends on the local <coughs> political system as well. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult, I, I don't have the solution right now, uh, I'm afraid, but. We have a lot of questions, so let's go on to this gentleman back. Uh, might it be possible to replace this whole sort of Greek problem of mining by switching uh, the sourcing of Tessan materials by filtering out of seawater? It's, I, I know that some reactors run on Tessan material that is simply being uh, filtered from seawater in the very low concentrations that is present in there. And that is sort of like to be neutral, that it, it, it wanders no one's country. Um, isn't that sort of like a relatively feasible and easy technical solution to say, well, to do away with this very ugly process of uh, uranium mining altogether. And I have to say the last uh, couple of years, I have not followed the developments in terms of alternatives for getting your uranium out of seawater. I know it was tested at that time, um, but not economically feasible. But if you say there's reactors now currently working on it, it surprises me, but maybe it's, and there's other experts in the audience that know about this. So I don't know the answer to that. If there are, maybe we can we can still have time for people to meet after the after the event. And maybe there's somebody here who has more information about that. We have another question though. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I would say spread the word. Because if you talk about uh, nuclear energy, everybody talks about the dangers, everybody talks about the nuclear waste afterwards, but nobody talks about this. Um, what you have been uh, telling, of course, is a, is a very big scandal. But the question I have is about to put it a little bit in perspective. So what is the spatial scale 
of these problems? Is it is it beyond the village you mentioned? Huh? Is it is it is it far beyond? A second, what are the, the environmental problems in countries like Australia and uh, and Canada? Yeah. Um, so the, on the first question, in the, in the case of Niger, it's basically the the villages and around the villages. Um, but and then in the vast area around it, nobody is living apart from the nomads who, who are going there with their uh, their uh, yeah <laughs> cows and uh, and sheep and goats. Um, and they don't they apparently they um, I said it avoid the area around the mines because there's not enough water for their cattle anyway. Um, so you could say there the impact is rather local, but it's the villages, which are quite big, I think 60,000. Yeah. Um, in Australia and Canada, around mines, there's also a lot of pollution. In mines, mines give pollution per definition. Um, there's, depending on where you go, and I haven't seen this with my own eyes, so I only know from the literature, uh, the local population uh, in, in Australia, it's the Aboriginals. In, in Canada, it's the people up there in Saskatchewan. Um, they are the one, the ones who, who need to give up part of their living environment. Um, and they are the ones whose, whose drinking water is being affected. Uh, also in Brazil, where I've been, it was the drinking water to, to the local population. There's local farming, uh, the, the, they use wells and the water in the wells was, was polluted as well. Uh, and these are poor, normally. Uh, poor areas. It will not be. There will not be uranium mining somewhere in the Netherlands. Where too, there will be too much resistance. It's poor areas. People who, who are beforehand normally not aware and um, uh, live from the land, uh, and that land is taken away from them. Taken away from them, at least uh, part of it. Um, and I know there's a lot of resistance uh, also in in Australia uh, from the Aboriginal community against that so it's uh it might be like a relatively small scale uh, for the mine but for the the people around it it's uh, a big impact yeah another question back here Jan. thank you uh, uh, thank you for the presentation i was attracted by the title of the presentation uh, a little bit surprised by the content but indeed you have shown us where the uranium comes from um, you mentioned in your presentation that um, well, mining is very polluting, um, okay? And you also mentioned that we don't need it. And these are, there are two things I'd like, like to have some further information on. One, uh, the polluting part, uh, mining, gold mines are very polluting as well. Uh, I mean, I hope that's not gold in your earrings, but you know, <laughs> we, we, have, we have also profited from mining, uh, from the mining business, yes, due to corruption and due to other political issues. Uh, not all the profit has been shared equally. And that's a fact of life. That's, that's human nature, unfortunately. It's a whole different topic to try to change that. I think we should, but I'm not sure that's relevant to the nuclear power uh, discussion. The second part of my question was, um, if, if we don't need it, and Greenpeace is also actively against fossil fuels, and you know we know we need to address the climate uh, issues uh, by reducing fossil fuel energy um, consumption, uh, so there's no, no more fossil fuel in the future and then no uranium or no plutonium or, or thorium, and not, no other way to, to, to cover the baseload uh, um, needs of energy, then uh, how can you say that we don't need this? What is your alternative? Okay, so for the first part of your question, you say it's a, it's a, it's a fact of it's human nature, it's a fact of life and not an issue for the uranium, uh, for the, the nuclear fuel or nuclear power discussion, but I, I don't agree with that. I think for all all the, the energy sources or anything we do, actually, uh, we need to consider what is the impact, including what happens around uranium mining. That needs to be solved. We agree on that. Um, but I think it should be considered. And the, the Dirk had a, a quote in his slide from the IPCC, who is comparing the different energy options, uh, also social and environmental impacts beyond only the climate impact. And they were basically saying that the coal mining, uranium mining, it's both bad social e environmental impacts. We, they balance each other out. So in that sense, it would be uh, approximately equal, but it's not something to ignore. Um, 
And then on your second question, yeah, I don't want, really want to go into an energy debate. Uh, as Greenpeace, we think there are alternatives. Uh, first, we need to reduce uh, a lot of energy use and we can still reduce a lot. Um, we're speaking about that in, in this building, for example, as well. Um, and, and then what you produce, you produce with, with uh, renewable energy sources uh, and, and gas as a transition fuel. Uh, there's scenarios for that that show that it's possible to do that. There are. Just recently, uh, nuclear power has been added to the renewable. Uh yeah, of the IEA, but not of the Greenpeace or the. There's also scenarios that don't have that. Yeah. But, but you need to you need to present an alternative, and the the renewables, for example, solar and wind, simply cannot cover the base load. In combination with other things. Bio Sir, maybe we can get into this uh, afterwards because we do have more time in the room. To raise this issue because. I understand your presentation, I understand the message, but I think we should be very careful to, to uh, influence public opinion on, uh, on the energy discussion with a presentation like this, focusing on very local, like the gentleman in the back said, uh, small-scale uh, pollution issues that do need to be addressed, but shouldn't, in the bigger picture, affect public opinion to, uh, away from the possibility of using nuclear fuel to reduce our fossil fuel consumption. But that, that was not the purpose of this presentation, until, unless I'm mistaken, but that was no. not the purpose of this presentation. It's Thank not you. a campaign, it's a information it's, sharing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a point taken, sir. Thank you. Again, we have more time after the Q&A. We have maybe another minute for one last question, then we have to wrap up. Question to you also, uh, Klaas. Um, didn't you inform about the, the fuel also used for our own reactor and wasn't the answer related to different types of uranium? And this was my question also to you. Are there different classes or types internationally um, determined and does that mean anything uh, for the way that they are mined? You remember this, right? Or Yes, I, of course we have a nuclear institute, a research institute here in Delft. There's a nuclear reactor as what maybe a kilometer that way. Um, and I did ask them the same question, where does our fuel come from? I didn't really get a, an, uh, an answer that I understood. But what I did understand is that it's very difficult to find out what exactly the source is. But I think maybe you can... Yeah, I can say a little bit about um, Because as I showed, the, there's so many different steps before it actually goes into the, the nuclear power station. So you have the, uh, at some point, the uranium hexafluoride that is going to the enrich enrichment plant and that is going to a fuel production plant and that is put in the uh, nuclear power reactor. Um, and it, it's possible that in the uh, enrichment plants, like this, there's uranium coming from different air, different other plants. So I don't know how much it's being tracked as, as being uh, your, your piece of uranium or something. So I don't know what they mean specifically by the batches. It can also be because um, you have the, the reprocessing that I showed. There's some of the uranium that is being uh, uh, won back from the reprocessing is being re-enriched and mixed with, um, with fresh uranium ore to form uranium fuel again. Uh, and then I guess it, it becomes even more difficult to, to find out where it originally came from. And it's not really very open as well, this, this uranium market. Um, and maybe they have different batches. Maybe they buy one day here and it comes from Kazakhstan and the next day they buy here and it comes from Namibia. Or, so that is, yeah, it's not very open. It's not easy to track, but Dirk would have been able to answer this question much better. Basically, it's not like your T-shirts or your coffee or your chocolate with a label that tells you exactly where it comes from. It could have that. I'm sure the reactor can uh, could decide, or a country could decide, we only import from this country. Yeah. All right, that's unfortunately all the time we have for questions today. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Liana for her lecture and for answering the questions. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We do have we do have the room for another half hour. I don't know, Liana, are you in a hurry? Uh, I can stay a little bit. Stay a yep. little bit. All right. Well, then I invite all of you guys to stick around if you want to meet each other, talk to Liana, and uh, of course, it's a very interesting topic now that we know more about the source to keep talking about what we think about it. So thank you guys, and hopefully you have time to check out the exhibition once again in the opposite corner of the library.